All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing video cast and podcast. Today is Sunday, January the 22nd, 22nd, that's right, 2017. And our guest this Sunday is writer Stephen Mark Rainey. Hey, Mark. How do you? How are you? I'm here. Um, do introductions in a second here. Before I do that, um, tomorrow is, I believe, the last day. If you're listening to this podcast and you actually like it, um, vote for us at This Is Horror. So just Google This Is Horror, and uh, I believe it's the first one that comes up on Google, and click on Awards. And I think tomorrow's the last day, as I said. We're up for Best Podcast, and Bottom Cthulhu's up for Best Anthology. Um, and if you want to email the show, it's lovecrafteasing at gmail.com. Uh, Matt, you got a prize? Yes, I do. Of course I do. Um, unfortunately, this is a sequel, so you have to provide the first one on your own. Black January. Um, Red Equinox. This is Black January. Um, it is by Douglas Wynn. This is a nice paperback copy. Uh, we will be happy to give it to the person who sends us the most money. Did you see... Last week, I think it was, I sent you the winner, uh, and somebody had taken you at your word and photocopied a $20 bill into the email. That was pretty funny. <laughs> we have some great great listeners. See, I'm just thinking, you know, I, I'm old, okay? So I used to watch the Soupy true. Sales show. You don't remember Soupy Sales. He had a kid's show with puppets, and he was pretty popular for a while, and and then, like, the guy was, like, out of control, and he said, hey, kids, for fun, while, you're, while your parents don't know what's going on, why don't you go in your mom's purse, your dad's wallet, and take out some of those green bills and send them in to us? <laughs> they got envelopes full of money coming in, and he got his show canceled. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, Joe, I got some feedback on your end. Can you hit your mute button when you're not talking? Mm-hmm. But feel free to talk all you want. I'll just unmute. Uh, all right, let's do introductions, and let's start on Rick's side um, and work our way over. Rick? Rick Lay, writer. Matt? Uh, Matt Carpenter, sometimes an editor, mostly not. <laughs> Doctor. Doctor. Uh, Kelly? Uh, Kelly Young, executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine. And Mr. Pulver? Joe Pulver, writer, editor. All right, I'm Mike Davis, chief cook and bottle washer at Lovecraft Easing. Uh, I'm not an executive editor. Only some of us uh, reach that goal. Someday, Mike. Keep trying. I, you know what? Every day I wake up and it's it's on my bathroom mirror. You know. WWKD. <laughs> what would Kelly do? <laughs> Uh, last but not least, our special guest today, uh, Mark, you want to just, uh, for anyone watching, listening, <clears throat> excuse me, who does not know who you are, can you talk a little bit about yourself? If you insist. Um, <laughs> I do. All right. You have to. You're the guest. I am uh, Stephen Mark Rainey. Go by Mark. Uh, I, uh, I've been a writer for quite a few years. I edited um, Death Realm magazine from 1987 to 1997. I've got out uh, what, six or seven novels, about 110 or 120 short stories, uh, several short fiction collections, and I've done a number of scripts for the Big Finish uh, Dark Shadows audio drama series that features uh, members of the original uh, Dark Shadows TV cast from uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and that's probably more than you want to hear. You know what I wish? I wish we had somebody on the panel who knew at least a little something about Dark Shadows so they could... <laughs> I, I, I think you might, actually. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to start there, Rick, or do you want me to start? Well, I can start. I, I was saying, for those who know, uh, uh, two of them, there were three... Uh, that uh, Mark did, and uh, two of them have mythos connections, Curse of the Pharaohs, which is uh, 
nephrin, nephrin car, but they sort of pronounce it nephrin car. But it ties into the tomb of nephrin car. And then the um, other one, and I'm trying to remember now, it's got Lara Parker and David Selby in it. What, what was the title of that uh, one? Path of Faith. That was, that was the first one I did. Yeah. That one had a statue of Dagon. It did, didn't it? I, yeah. and then I, you, I didn't remember that. You had a, you had a third one which uh, tied into Twins Peaks. Uh, Blood Dance. Um, well, sort of, you know, I did sort of have some uh, twin, twin Peaks in mind. I kept everything tangential, you know, so as not to, uh, you know, cross any copyright boundaries or anything yeah. like that. But, but, yeah, I was sort of channeling a little Twin Peaks for that one. It had at least a homage to Blue Rose. Yeah, exactly. It uh, yeah had a Blue Rose in there. How did all that happen that you wrote those? Well, in the 90s, uh, Beth Massey and I, Elizabeth Massey, we wrote a, a co-wrote a Dark Shadows novel, uh, Dreams of the Dark. Uh, and the uh, producer at Big Finish, uh, Stuart Manning, uh, was quite taken with that novel, and uh, it was a few years later, uh, it was in the mid to late 2000s, uh, when they started doing those uh, audio dramas, and he asked, would I be interested in, in doing um, some scripts, and I said, sure, so he sent me some um, outlines of how the uh, stories, they, you know, they had, all their stories were inter connected or if standalone they followed a certain continuity so he sent me an outline of all this stuff a sample script and i thought you know this uh this would be fun so i came up with a scenario that tied into um uh, um era of the show itself and um all of all of the ones i did actually took up threads well blood dance maybe not so much but the first two took up threads that were to some extent unresolved in the show. The first one I did, um, Path of Fate, featured David Selby as Quentin Collins and Laura Parker as Angelique, um, you know, reprising their roles from the TV show. Uh, the, the werewolf and the witch for uh, uh, Yes, yes, very much. Um, of course, I would have loved to have featured um, Barnabas, but um, Jonathan Fred, who is, you know, he's since died in the years. He did do one of the audio dramas, but uh, by then he was not in good health and all. They did have um, another actor, and I believe it was Andrew Collins, who yes. played uh, Barnabas. And from the couple that I've listened to, he did a, a wonderful job of it. But at the time I was working on him, they, there wasn't really a place for Barnabas in the timeline so i did focus on quentin for two of them and the second of them which was uh curse of the pharaoh as you mentioned that one tied into um the sub story in dark shadows of what was called the leviathans which were very clearly based on uh lovecraft's old ones yeah so i i did a little um tweaking of the mythos in as much as I could, with, once again, you know, without um, bringing in what I felt might be uh, any kind of copyright issues or ownership issues, anything like that. Uh, but I took the unresolved threads from the Dark Shadows TV show and tied them more directly into uh, Lovecraftian history, so to speak, the, uh, the Egyptian connection with Nefren Ka and and how that could have possibly tied into the background of the characters in the Dark Shadows uh, story of the Leviathans. And in the end, that's actually been one of the more, uh, and Path of Fate was, was probably the one that sold the best and the most popular. But quite by chance, just last week, I, I never Google my name. I suppose I ought to do that once in a while. But I Googled my name and I found um, uh, several, actually, Dark Shadows message boards that went into great depth about 
looking at the audio dramas and my contributions and stuff like that. And I was just flabbergasted to find how popular that particular audio drama was simply because it did uh, close up some of what were probably the most uh, lingering unanswered threads from the show. And that's got to feel that, that was very gratifying. Yeah, I was going to say that's got to feel great. And and I want to clarify for the audience: these are not you did not write books that were adapted into audio dramas. You were writing audio dramas, correct? That's right. These were these were scripts. They, these were not works of fiction that were adapted in any way. Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead, there's Rick, one I'm last sorry. thing in in the Dark Shadows novel that Mark wrote, uh, Dreams of Darkness. There's this wonderful section where everybody's shouting, uh, 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 a vampire, and I think it's Angelique and Barnabas, they're all shouting uh, chants in French. And you get all these mythos names hidden in there. Yeah. That, now, Joe may appreciate this. There was a character called uh, Diabolos in Dark Shadows. You're saying Joe's the devil? He was the devil. Uh, is. He, well, he's devilish. <laughs> devilish. I, I, I've I've been called the devil before. But the more, more colorful language than that, but same difference. <laughs> the Abelos in the show uh, was all you know. He was fa fairly enigmatic, barely a presence at all. But it was uh, insinuated that he was uh, Angelique's master, the ultimate master. You know. So, in Dreams of the Dark, when Diabolos appears, it is with a cityscape behind him with um, the moon showing behind the cityscape, behind this large lake, and he's dressed all in yellow and wearing a mask. So, um, I did not describe or use any proper names in there other than Diabolos, but I felt that description, uh, you know, would would make a nice for those in the know might uh, might bring in a uh, a little tie into the king in yellow well i, I have to ask Indeed. this and i hope i hope that i don't i'm sorry joe you got a question you go ahead oh no 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 go ahead i was just just pleased he did that that's all <laughs> so was I. this one another thing you did mark when you passed the fate you had these hellhounds yeah looking for diabolos and I'm thinking Hounds of Tendalus. Hounds of yeah, yeah, no no overt connection, but <laughs> just by way of description and uh, uh, the, the, the sensory words I use to describe them, things like that. Yeah, you could definitely make that connection if, that's, if that was so mine. I did that intentionally, you know, to keep it vague, but to, to make it where if one were so inclined to make that connection, please do. You get the feeling that Rick loves this. You know, <laughs> oh, yeah. does, but and, and and that was one of the things with Marcus. You know, he was he was always I, I don't want to call them vague references, but he was never looking to codify anything. You know, um, just these lovely touches for, for the most part that were in the background, like Easter uh, eggs, basically. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and and I always thought he did a really marvelous job with that, you know. Well, I have a question, Mark. Uh, yeah. and at the risk of boring my audience, but I, I just have to ask this because I'm so into um, uh, audio drama and radio plays and so forth. I've been listening to them since I was a kid. So my question is this: both. From that standpoint, and also I'm in the middle of writing an audio play, an audio drama right now. Uh, you've written novels, short stories, and so forth, uh, also edited. How is writing an audio drama, what approach, how did you approach this differently as opposed to writing, say, a novel or a novella? Yeah, the, the thing about the audio dramas, particularly for Dark Shadows, is that they were geared for two performers. You'd okay. have, uh, for example, Angelique and Quentin. We had uh, Carolyn and a new <coughs> character uh, named Gretchen Warwick in uh, Curse of the Pharaoh, and Quentin Collins and, and another new character in um, Blood Dance. So I had to focus on two 
points of view using a lot of dialogue to propel the story more so than I generally would in uh, in a either a novel or or a short story try to make the descriptions as vivid as possible yet keeping them uh, fairly brief and straightforward the when I got the sample script that Stuart Manning sent me originally and I started reading through it and I listened to a couple of the uh, existing audio dramas I thought you know this is um, an awful lot like what I did when I was in my teenage years and that was create Godzilla stories that I would perform on tape using sound effects from all the Godzilla movies. And that's 15 minutes till we got to Godzilla. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, when I, when I was a youngster, I had uh, two tape decks and a uh, turntable with, and all the, the, these Godzilla soundtrack albums. And so I would create these brand new Godzilla stories and narrate them and do voices and put in sound effects and all this oh, stuff. Wow. And I thought, you know, that just follows the kind of shit that I did when I was 15 years old. Only now <laughs> it has to be a little more professional, you know. But it's still, to me, it was the work of a loving fan to do Dark Shadows because I loved Dark Shadows dearly as a youngster. And that, you know, that stuck with me uh, all through my adult years. So it felt um, natural enough, but there was definitely a difference. It wasn't like I could sit down with the idea that I'm just going to write another short story. I had to be very focused on the rhythm of dialogue, the uh, timing for when characters would appear, uh, and make it more of a uh, play, make, make it as if I were writing an Honest to God play. And the, the format... Uh, came came pretty well to me, and the uh, the uh, audience seems to have really uh, really been taken with them, and that's very gratifying. Um, of course, she tied in a lot of Lovecraft, as Rick was talking about uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, did, yeah, that's go ahead, Rick. For more. Did Did you get to meet the actors? Uh, not specifically for the audio dramas, but after. Um, <laughs> Massey and I wrote the first um, novel, the Harper Collins novel. Uh, we did go to um, a couple of the Dark Shadows Fests. One of them was in 1999. It was at the World Trade Center in New York and uh, went to a couple in Terrytown, the Sleepy Hollow area. The, uh, the Lyndhurst estate is there in Terrytown where they filmed the two movies, House of Dark Shadows and Night of Dark Shadows. Now, I had actually met Jonathan Frid, uh, Barnabas, several times at various conventions, and uh, he did a one-man show called Fools and Fiends that he did on the road, and he actually came uh, to High Point, right near where we live. Now, at the time, my ex-wife had been in, the, she had, uh, she had fairly major surgery the day Jonathan Frid was there. So I had spent most of the day at the hospital and come, you know, six o'clock, I had to get over to High Point. I'm like, sorry, John's and Fred's coming, you know, so <laughs> uh, off to see Barnabas. But uh, he was the first and only human being I've ever stood in line to get an autograph from. And that was at, uh, I was in a, some convention in Atlanta, probably in the early 90s. Uh, but at other, at the other oh, group, for the love of God, see what I got to put up here. You yeah, you told me that would happen. That's okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Cats are welcome on the show. He's going to come sit upon me. for. He's going to do it. Um, I met uh, a lot of the stars at the various conventions or the, the um, Gark Shadows Fest that we went to. And for the most part, I was really quite uh, taken with them. Uh, just very down to earth, uh, uh, easy to talk to, um, John Carlin that played Willie Loomis, you know, that, oh, for crying out loud. All right. I'm gonna be like That's this, awesome. Uh, record. But, uh, um, Hey, you're just going to have to talk with your cat on your shoulder. That's yeah. All. Yeah. Um, John Carlin <laughs> had played Willie Loomis in the show, you know, when, uh, I introduced myself as, you know, a writer of the new Harper Collins, dark shadows novel. 
and he you know he was just like an old buddy and we sat and shot the shit for quite a while roger davis that had played several roles in the you're heavy get down he actually i was going to do a reading from uh dreams of the dark and so come time for the reading he got out there where all these people were in the uh, commons area of the hotel and was just like dark shadows reading here get in here get in here dark shadows reading and the place just filled up i had a really great reading it was a great time and um then he and i sat and talked about the book for a while because that was his first exposure to it and he said uh something to the effect of you just outshone Ann Rice with that, you know, and I'm like, well, that's, that's very gratifying to hear too. Um, my, the big event at the show, the first show I went to, the one at the World Trade Center was um, a, uh, a showcase with Laura Parker, who had been, uh, who was Angelique in the show. And when I was watching Dark Shadows as a kid, Honest to God, Laura Parker was the first woman I ever fell in love with. I mean, I was just <laughs> gaga. I tuned into Dark Shadows every day so I could see Angelique. And so to be, she talked about her first Dark Shadows novel. Um, and I talked about mine and we got to compare notes and talk about writing and stuff. So actually being on stage, um, at some point I just randomly yelled, you know, and then, <laughs> I was like, I was like, did you notice? Oh, that's you know, great. Me and I suddenly went, wow! <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so it, it was a lot of you fun. see that rebel really yell thing? That's, that, that's a real thing. That's not something somebody <laughs> made up. And, you know, isn't that what it's all about, though, Mark? I think a lot of beginning writers, they think of things like money or fame. But I, I look at the rewards. What's that? I, I, don't, I don't ever think of those things. One will yeah, that may be the words that, like what you're just talking about, those are that, those are very rewarding things. Yeah, no, well, that, that's not true. I mean, I don't almost never write anything for no pay. But uh, so, Well, know, I don't, got, I'm not saying uh, you should write for no pay, no. <laughs> yeah, I've got uh, what I would call little fame, but at least in the – business i have recognition and that means the world to me a lot of times right. because uh you know if you know i can go to a convention or you know some some writer you know that i may or may not have ever seen in my life say i'm mark rainey and a lot of times i'll know exactly who i am and why and sometimes they don't punch me in the face or anything which is really nice <laughs> so when and how did you first uh get exposed to Lovecraft and cosmic horror? I was, you know, a lot of, a lot of my peers discovered Lovecraft at a far younger age. I was around, let's see, I think I was probably 21. I was in college at the university of Georgia and I was living in a house out in the sticks outside of Athens, Georgia. And a, and a friend of mine who knew I was into monsters and, horror and that kind of thing. He had a bunch of the old, uh, I believe they were the old Valentine uh, Lovecraft anthologies. And he says, I bet you would probably like these. And I remembered having seen the uh, movie, the Dunwich Horror from what, 1970, you know, with uh, Dean Stockholm, Sandra D and all. And I remember thinking that that had been kind of a silly movie, but at the same time, there, there was a certain creepy factor, and to this day, I still quite enjoy that. But uh, I started reading, I, I don't remember if it was actually the Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos, Volume 2 or something like that. It was, it was one that had a whole bunch of different writers. It wasn't just Lovecraft. And I remember reading Robert Block's Notebook in a Deserted House. Oh, sure. And that, I read, that, that would be uh, Volume 2. That, that was Volume 2. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And... Uh, and but I had he probably gave me eight, eight or nine of the books, and I remember reading the Dunwich Horror and Dreams in the Witch House and Haunter of the Dark, all within that first couple of nights. And this this house where I lived, I, I rented a bedroom with uh, there were what five other people I think, 
and it was exceedingly rare for me to be alone in the house. But on this particular weekend, when I was reading Lovecraft, I was all by myself out there. And for the first time, probably since I was a little kid, when I turned out the lights that night, I sat up and went, this, this is awful. So I turned the lights back on for a little while. And what did I, I read some more. I, I decided to read some more. And then finally, I got so damn tired. My eyes gave out on me. And I went on to sleep. But honest to God, I had a case of nerves. And I didn't think at that at that point in my life, at age 21, I didn't think there was a chance in hell of that ever happening again. But it sure right. was something I read. But it sure did. And I was hooked from, from then on. I was I was hooked. <clears throat> Did, did you then, and then do you now, or is it different from back then, have a favorite Lovecraft story or a couple of favorites? What well, really hit you? There are several. Um, uh, of the, that first bunch that I read, I think it was Haunter of the Dark that, that moved me the most. There was something about the descriptor of the old church and the draw to it. That one has, is or was and is a favorite. Dreams in the Witch House is another favorite. And I have, um, I have used in various stories, I've, uh, I've put, like, uh, like y'all were saying, sort of an Easter egg, you know, that ties back to um, Dreams in the Witch House. Did I do that? Rick probably knows. Did I do that in Dark Shadows? It seems like I did. I don't know if you, t you had in incantations to Shem Nagurath and Agatha. Yeah. Uh, um, I, that, that's the thing, having written for 30 some years and having a, you know, a fairly sizable catalog of work, there, there, there really are. There's people who know my work better than I do. I, I can't remember <laughs> crap half the time. Uh, but, but back to the, uh, the Lovecraft, I was, I was always quite taken with the Dunwich Horror. And at some point, after that, I read uh, Bierce's The Damned Thing, which Lovecraft obviously was influenced by, and I really loved that story. And in fact, I think Bierce's The Damned Thing is, is rates up there as one of my uh, favorite horror, horror stories. Uh, I, I was never really keen on the... Um, the dream stories and Randolph Carter stories and stuff. Uh, although I did really like uh, the dream quest of unknown Kadath, but stuff like the silver key and all those just didn't appeal to me, at least as stories. But when I'm writing my own stories, more and more, I feel myself drawn back to the theme of the dreamlands. And I've done uh, one of the most recent stories I did um, deals with the, the dreamlands and it's been submitted to a, particular anthology and we, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes, but, uh, that, that's, um, it, it's really hard for me to pick favorites yeah. because something I read back then and I read again today and my opinion may change of it sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. It sounds like Connor of the dark is really up there though. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it that, is that for me as well. Yeah. Favorite that in, uh, Probably the thing on the doorstep was another one. Oh yeah, and yeah. whisper in darkness. Oh, well, I'm I'm gonna get side. Is it okay for me to sidetrack a little? Sidetrack all you want. <laughs> we're we're informal. <laughs> okay, um, as you probably all of you know from past experience, I'm big into geocaching, going out in the woods and hunting yes. little little things with a GPS and all. But up in Virginia, there is um, in the mountains there. There's a gorge <laughs> called. I see that. I see that. Make him stop. <laughs> um, there's a gorge. It's a Rock Castle Creek Gorge. And it's a long uh, 14, I think it's 14 mile trail. It goes through the gorge and then up the ridge and up and around. Uh, it's um, the, just the most scenic place you've ever seen. But there's a gravel road that goes that doubles as an actual hiking trail that goes into the gorge uh crosses creeks you um go back probably two or three miles down this gorge trail and there's an old farmhouse a two-story white farmhouse that has been there since the uh late 1800s 
and the rest of the land there is all uh, i believe a state park um, i think the state owns it but that's the only uh there's this little island of private land in there and when we the first time i hiked this a few years ago we came upon this farmhouse and i'm like oh my god that is the whisper in the darkness right there that's that is the house I, I, if y'all the some of y'all may have even seen the photos i've posted on facebook and on my blog and such but uh of course uh my girlfriend kim was walking with me and she got subjected to the entire story of whisper and darkness and all this stuff lovecraft so she probably uh got sick to death of all the lovecraft after after we encountered that farmhouse out there okay i'm done sidetracking no i was actually going to say and maybe i asked you this last time you were on but i know we have a lot of new listeners since then uh just real briefly explain what geocaching is and then also i'm, I'm wondering if you if you have ever or plan to write a story uh that <laughs> with that theme or that includes that i should say yeah, because it seems like there's a, there's some good story potential there. Yeah, um, geocaching is an activity, uh, and it's in the last few years it's it's gotten quite uh, uh, quite popular. Where you go out, it could be anywhere, but uh, a lot of them are in the woods where someone will hide a container of sorts and. Uh, it may be something very tiny. It may be a big old ammo can full of swag. But all geocaches have a log sheet in them. And the that's the sign when you find it. The hider marks the uh, coordinates of the hide on his GPS. And then it is uh, published. That cache is published on the geocaching website. So that hunters can now enter those coordinates into their GPS and it's your job to go out there and find the thing. And it may be very difficult. It may be easy. It, uh, it can have a physical challenge. It may be 90 feet up a giant tree. It can be down in uh, storm drains. I've, I've done several that are so far underground that uh, you know, anybody with claustrophobia would probably have a real time with that. And, and conversely, if you have acrophobia, going up some of those trees is no picnic. Hey, quick question, though, before yeah. I forget to ask you. Do you need special equipment or can you just use a smartphone app? You, there is uh, there's a couple of good smartphone apps. So, yes, you can use them with the smartphone. It, especially when you're out in the woods, it helps to have an Honest God GPS, like a, a Garmin GPS battery life is better and they're more if not more accurate they respond quicker than the GPS sure. is in, in your smartphone uh, so yes you can cache with just a smartphone but uh, ideally the way I do it is that I use both my phone and the GPS uh, and there's all like I said there's all kinds of com uh, they, they may be complex they they uh, may be what they call a night cache and i've done a couple with lovecraftian themes believe it or not uh, really similar night caches are set up where they're usually out on a trail in the woods there we have quite a lot of trails in this area uh they're set up with reflectors what you do is you follow a trail of reflectors little tacks that are uh, affixed to trees at certain intervals and you, you take a nice bright flashlight out there and you have to follow that reflector trail and or, or this this is the most common kind there are other permutations yeah. of it but going out there in the woods following these uh, lines of reflectors uh, that lead you to stages or to the uh, final cache itself I've set up one called dweller in darkness <laughs> oh, that's great! And there's a backstory to it where um, I'm gonna well, I'm gonna give some spoilers here. So if there's any geocachers listening, they're gonna get a heads up. But you follow a trail of reflectors, which I call the glowing eyes in the woods, to a uh, to what I call the uh, what did I call it the the beast with it with many eyes and a gaping mouth, and it's this gigantic <laughs> tree with a big old hole in it 
that I put reflectors all over the damn thing. So when you get to it, there's no mistaking that with all these reflectors, you know, that this is the thing with many eyes. And then you have to, once you get to that tree, you have to reach inside and I've got a bone. It's probably the femur from a deer that I etched the coordinates to the next stage into, into that deer bone. And I fastened it into the tree with fishing line. And so then you have to follow yet more reflectors into the woods, go into those coordinates. And when you finally find the final stage, it's a human skull with a little container inside it that has the log sheet that you have to sign to show that you've been there. <laughs> and uh, some of you may get this. It is the skull of one Maurice Zahn, who is a character from my story, uh, Threnody that was one of my earliest, earliest short stories. Uh, he was clearly, an, well, he was an undefined relation of Eric Zahn, obviously, uh, and was sort of the basis for several stories that I wrote that started with Threnody and the Spheres Beyond Sound. So when, when geocaching, uh, when, I, when I got into geocaching, I thought, what a perfect compliment to doing, you know, to doing some of this horror stuff. And I've got, yeah. okay, I've got yeah. Godzilla ca themed caches out there. I've got Lovecraftian caches. I've got one night cache called the tripods that's based on War of the Worlds. You have to follow sets of three reflectors here and there. Um, and it, it's been a fabulous activity for me. And sounds like a really, really fun way for us old people to keep in shape. I need to. Start. I I credit geocaching with stopping me smoking, with losing almost twenty pounds, and uh, just being an all around better health. Now, the thing about geocaching is that I've I've been doing it for nine years, and I've accumulated something like ninety two hundred cash fines, mostly in this area and the surrounding. Uh, right. communities and such so it's very difficult for me to go after caches that i haven't already found so i have to go farther and farther afield to do it uh, and so i don't get into hiking and uh, exploration as much as i used to now to address your other question about fiction yes i've written at least one story it was a very very short story and i think it was called black tom and it was in a book. I can't remember what book it was in. But anyway, it, it appeared in a book. Um, and I started, I, I actually did a portion of a novel. I outlined a novel called The Night Cash about a mysterious uh, night cache, like the one I was telling you about, you know, how they get, they, they're set up for nighttime hunting. Right. And it was a uh, sort of a, uh, the, the description on the in in my story of it, uh, it, the description tells of this night cache that no one has yet found, and this group of hunters decide to go out after this cache, but uh, they learn early on that there's nothing at all normal about this cache. A lot of people will say, "Well, well, you know, why don't you write a story about a cache that you know that's got body parts and stuff in it?" Well, you know, no, because half the a lot of the caches you go after. You know, if you've got morbid hiders like me, you're going to find fake body parts in them already. I, I wanted to do something a little bit more out of the ordinary. I really like that premise, actually. Yeah. You're, you're the one you're yeah, describing. It, it, the, the more I got into it, and I, I, was, I worked on it for several months, a couple of years, well, more than a couple of years, about four years ago. And as I progressed with it, I kept finding myself deviating from the plot that I was that, that I had sort of preconceived for myself and finding I was writing a lot more about caching than actually propelling the story because you just, I, it's so easy to get swept up in it. And so I said, okay, I got to let this cool. I'm going to put that aside. I had deadlines for other short stories and I've been so busy with hey, Mark, what about fiction that I just haven't, uh, I haven't dedicated myself to getting back to that novel, but, but I, what think about, I um, you know, this would be a, it just occurs to me that this would be a great anthology with this theme of geocaching. Uh, yeah, well, I tell you this, now, this, it's a different animal altogether, but there was an anthology that I appeared in that was just this past year called GPS Great Personal Stories, and it was all geocaching stories by 
geocachers about their experiences. Um, you know, this particular volume, I think there were three volumes the, the woman did that edited it. Um, this one was like a tale of firsts. It was supposed to be stories about certain first experiences, maybe your first most memorable cache, your first cache up a tree. And mine was my first long underground, it was a recounting of my first uh, underground or long underground cache that I did where you have to spend hours in storm drains and tight underground tunnels. And I will tell you this, that was a cache that cured me of arachnophobia. In <laughs> fact, the story is called uh, Arachnid Alley or How I Learned to Stop Screaming and Love the Spider. <laughs> I'll give you a brief rundown of it. it uh, the, the cache was called Greensboro Underground and it's several stages where you have to go into uh, pipes. Uh, in some cases, pipes you actually have to crawl through, which, uh, like I said, can be fairly traumatic for the claustrophobe. Uh, some you could actually walk through. You're guaranteed to get wet, muddy, dirty, uh, possibly face copperheads, which I've done any number of times, black widows, all kinds of things down in there. But the story, th this is how things unfolded. There were the first stage was at a, uh, was under this bridge and the coordinates led us to an opening about three feet. It was a circular opening, you know, it was a, a culvert about three feet wide. And it's like, we've got to go in that thing. And I was with two other guys. Uh, one of whom was a, is a big burly fellow that just looks fearless, you know, you think he's, uh, you know, you, you feel safe with a guy like this. So he went first into this tunnel and, you know, he's creeping through, crouched down. And he went first, my friend Tom went second, and I was bringing up, I was tailing Charlie there. So somewhere in that darkness, I hear my friend Ethan, the guy up front, we hear all this screaming and hollering and we thought, oh my God, you know, maybe he fell into a, you know, some, sometimes, you know, there's like a vertical shaft and we were afraid he'd fallen into a vertical shaft and gotten injured. And we're like yelling, what's wrong? What's wrong? And we hear his voice come back. This is the biggest spider I've ever seen. <laughs> so, From the big guy. Yeah. Yeah. So Tom and I go on in there and sure enough, he, well, we hear him yelling, Oh my God, there's another one. Oh my God, the place is full of them. And sure enough, I saw you go that into this, there's a junction with several <laughs> pipes coming into this junction. All over the walls, there's like these four inch long wolf spiders and wandering spiders. They're, they're just spiders everywhere and they're huge. I had never seen such a conglomeration of gigantic spiders in my life. And trust me, I grew up scared as hell of spiders which is one of the draws of lovecraft to me because of this the other you know well right. that's spiders to me uh, so this is the scene that you're describing this is where they got the scene in raiders at the, at the first part of the movie <laughs> well there was an arrow there was a fluorescent arrow painted over top of one of the uh the culverts there that came into this junction. So we knew we had to go that way to get to the next stage. But there was a big old spider hanging right over top of that pipe. So I, uh, I took my hiking pole and swatted the spider with it. And that thing fell off and started skittering through the water straight toward Ethan there. And he's in this pipe, you know, dancing, you know, to, to make Fred a stare you know, look like an amateur and squalling at the top of his lungs. And I took to laughing. I got to laughing so hard. There was no way I could be, you know, I could be afraid of this stuff. So, and then Tom straight out of Indiana Jones points into that pipe and he says, it could be dangerous. You go first. So I, I crouched on down and I got into that pipe and it was full of spiders, but they were all just sitting there. They didn't bother me. And I figured, you know, if I can just scoot past these guys, they're not going to give a flip that I'm in here. So sure enough, I went on past them. And behind me, I could still hear Ethan going, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. You know? <laughs> so from that point on, 
honest to God, that cured me of arachnophobia. And that was the uh, story that I related in that anthology that, uh, that I was mentioning there. Well, I've got some more questions for you, but I want to say this before we move on from geocaching, that the video test I did with you yesterday reminded me that you do this and that I've been wanting to get into this with my son. And I live in a pretty small town in Texas, mm -hmm. about an hour from Dallas. So I thought, okay, there's not going to be anything around here. There's plenty. Mm -hmm. I went to the geocaching website. They're everywhere. Yeah. And so anybody that's listening that wants to get into geocaching, it seems like to me, Mark's the expert, but it seems like to me, no matter where you are, you can get into this. Mm -hmm. That's true. That is true. So um, what was I? I know what I was going to ask. Uh, favorite ho horror movies? You've been into horror since you were a kid. Wow. What are some of your favorites from back then and maybe some recent favorites? Okay. Probably, probably. Uh, my all-time, well, okay, I have a split for my favorite horror movie. There's two. John Carpenter's The Thing and uh, Curse of the Demon from 1957, I think it is, uh, Jacques Tournay film with uh, Dana Andrews and uh, Neil McGinnis. Uh, for very different reasons. Um, when I was a little kid, all of y'all probably know Famous Monsters of Filmland, the old magazine. Sure. There was a cover uh, way back when that had the demon from, from Curse of the Demon, or Night of the Demon, as it's known across the pond. And that image scared the hell out of me. But I didn't actually get to see the film until I was probably in my late teens, 17, 18. But there again, much like the, the little Lovecraft story I told you about reading Lovecraft for the first time, I was watching this old 1950s horror movie, and it gave me a wonderful shiver. And to this day, that's my go-to Halloween movie. Halloween cannot come until I have watched Curse of the Demon and The Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. That, that's every year. <laughs> And usually the thing. Yeah. You know, I saw the thing at the theater when it first came out and it was it was mind blowing. I was like, this is fantastic. And it, and I had heard prior to that that everybody was disappointed with the ending. And so we got to the ending and I thought it's a wonderful well, ambiguous ending, yeah. Yeah, yeah and when I when I saw it, I thought it it did kind of just sort of peter out there, but it haunted me. It stayed in my mind. And from there again, from that point on, every time I watched it, it, it would acquire, there was, there was always something. And it's the same with Curse of the Demon. Those, those movies, there's always something. I've, I've seen both of them probably upwards of 30 times. I don't know. And, and they don't get old. I, I never get tired of them. What do you think, though? I don't think the ending is bad. I thought it no. was. No, no, it's not. I don't think very so. Very suitably ambiguous and creepy. Right. Yeah, that's, that's what people had said. I, I remember reading, I think it was a newspaper review that was just said, well, you know, it was a great gory horror film, but the ending just leaves you hanging. And uh, So I went in there, I guess, with that preconceived notion, and my first thought was, yeah, it does just, it just leaves me hanging. But like I said, it, it preyed on my mind, and ever since that time, I felt it, was, it, it actually was the perfect ending to it. It, en it enhances the movie, in my opinion. Agree. It makes you know because what people talk about that ending, they think about it. You know what what's really going on. It, it's it's elevates it somewhat. That's what I, yes, I admire that a lot about that movie, and pro and that uh, maybe more than a lot of fiction that I've read influenced me to leave questions unanswered, not, not necessarily to make things uh, so ambiguous that you think, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just blowing smoke. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and I'll tell you, and, the other, and another influence in that way would have been uh, Ted Klein's collection, uh, Dark Gods. His, his stories to me, oh, uh, great Chris collection. Schreiber's Smoke Ghost, they, they leave you with they, or they give you enough information to draw your own conclusions, but it doesn't tell you everything. And so that, um, I think the thing was the thing that first put that 
bug in my mind. And of course, when I first saw the thing, I wasn't really writing fiction. I was doing a lot of creative shit, but I wasn't writing, not toward, with an eye toward getting published. But that idea of I, as the author, must know what's going on in the story, around the story, and beyond the story. But I don't need to tell all that to my reader. Right. And that's that's a that's an idea that has stuck with me ever since seeing the thing. I think. That's interesting. Um, what What is your favorite story in Dark Gods? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's that's one that's really hard. And, and you know what? I need to do. It's been. I think we talked about this last time I was on a couple of years ago, okay. and I haven't reread it since because I said back then. I need to reread that. I haven't read it in years and years and years. And I have not reread re it again since then. Ch but Children of the Kingdom is my favorite. So I they're, they're all great. But. Yeah, I think maybe, maybe Petey. Oh, sure. Only because that's the one that made me think an awful lot um, about how did these incidents tie together what's he trying to tell me how do these things tie in where do they di diverge and why and again i would have to reread it to uh I, who knows i might have a wholly different opinion of it but those stories in dark gods shaped a way of for, for me to think about fiction and composing it uh but, and then there were, of course, Nadelman's God, I loved a lot. I, I thought the narrative voice was wonderful. All of them, the narrative voice is, is wonderful. Uh, but there was something about Nadelman's God of having written lyrics to like a rock and roll song, and suddenly it has blossomed into this weird supernatural force, you know, that, or that's used by a supernatural force. And... Uh, that one does seem to me to have been influenced by uh, Fritz Leiber's Smoke Ghost, which is another one that uh, I, I quite love. And again, I I need to revisit a lot of my favorite old things, things that I read in my 20s, maybe my 30s. I have not revisited for the most part. And uh, there, there are times that I think I should because they truly they were instrumental in my development as a writer, but I haven't gone back to to read them again to to see how my 20 and 30 year uh older mind takes these things in right you you mentioned curse of the demon before there's a big debate over that movie yes in that whether they should have included the monster or not because it was inserted afterwards over the right even though I, I, I first thought I liked the monster, I can, uh, they, they, it was a debate whether it should have been more like uh, the Val Luton uh, horror movies where you don't see the uh, creature. Personally, while I, while I rationally recognize the shortcomings of, this, of the demonic monster, I thank heaven it's in there because that's what drew me to the movie. I think that it, uh, although the movie itself is not what I would consider Lovecraftian, or the premise isn't necessarily Lovecraftian, since it's, you know, uh, the, the, I think the fact that they did show the demon, and yet so much of the movie is this exploration of whether or not such a thing could truly exist, you know, so much of it is Dr. Holden thinking rationally. And uh, you, you uh, I think as a rational being, we gravitate toward his point of view. And yet we've already seen that the demon exists. And so in a way, that sort of does make it Lovecraftian to me because it shows the futility of human intellect versus the reality of what actually is out there now now i can appreciate the idea of leaving it ambiguous but I, but i think certainly from a dramatic point of view i i love the fact that we have this horrific looking thing and i'm not talking about the execution of the special effects the the 
design of that demon is horrifying. It, it scared the living crap out of me as a youngster. And a lot of you also know this, that that influenced my story, Fugue Devil, yeah. uh, from, from way on back. Uh, so, I, yes, I am very glad that the, that the demon actually made its appearance in that film. It's the, the movie is based on an M.R. James story, cast, yes, which I, I enjoy the story as well. Which I think Lovecraft mentioned in Supernatural and Horror. Yeah. Yeah, the M.R. James story is uh, is so different from the movie, but I think they both have their unique strengths. And I, I think the James story, um, it, it also rather depends on the reality of this demonic force because the very end of it was a it was an impartial observer witnessing a very not not the, certainly not the same creature from the film but an impartial observer witnesses the reality of a force from beyond mark talk a little bit about your your body of work you've written a novella called the gods of moab you've written a novel called blue devil island and so on and so forth. Um, well, well, first, let me ask you this. When and who published Blue Devil? When was it published in Blue Island? Blue Devil Island initially came out from uh, Thompson Gale, uh, the five-star line they had, and I think that was 2007. Hmm. And then it came out as a paperback from Marietta Books uh, a few years later. Not sure that may have been 2010, something like I, that. But uh, I could be thinking of somebody else, but I, something, another book. But I don't think that I am. I think that I picked that up at a uh, at a. Um, I can't think of the name of the bookstore right now. I'm blanking on the name of the bookstore. Uh, bookstore and just, but way before I read you, uh, met you and mm -hmm. read it and really enjoyed it. It's been quite a while. Okay, if it was a. Uh, Five Star put it out as a hardback. They they did have a soft cover edition, but it was large print. And then Marietta put it out, and more recently Crossroad Press, uh, after Marietta folded, uh, Crossroad Press put it out, and that's only been uh, that's been less than two years. Okay. Um, as as a paperback, well, um, the uh, cover art that Wayne Miller did initially for uh, the the Marietta edition is also used on the, on, on the crossroad edition, but, uh, well, yeah, talk, talk a little bit about your, your body of work. Uh, okay. I mentioned those two, two books. And All right. Well, I'll, I'll talk specifically about blue devil Island for a moment. Um, I've always been, um, very, uh, very much, uh, an aficionado of world war II aviation. Uh, particularly in Pacific, I, I, I've I've loved airplanes ever since I was a little kid. And in school, when I when I was very young, I, I read a lot of books about World War II and um, aviation in particular. I built scale model kits, uh, you know, with with just all kinds of excitement. I built tanks and I built airplanes and I built built ships. Uh, all World War II stuff. So as I got older, I started researching and reading about um, the history of, of uh, the World War, uh, both, both theaters, but something always drew me to the Pacific theater. And yes, it might have been Godzilla Joe. Uh, and over, uh, back in the 19, late 1990s, uh, I got into uh, flight simulators on my computer. I did a, uh, there was a commercial flight simulator. Microsoft did a commercial flight simulator. Then my wife at the time got me a joystick and boy, that ruined me because I downloaded this online game called uh, Air Warrior. It was an interactive World War II flight sim where they, uh, you, you get to go into World War II airplanes and fly live against other people doing the same thing, you know, and they, they did a, a nice job of modeling individual uh, World War II aircraft. And there's a much, you know, in following Air Warrior, a new generation of the game, 
uh, by a different different company. It's called uh, Ace is High, and it's still it's still going. But it's very immersive and very authentic. Um, so I yeah, learned I all about aerial combat fun. maneuvers, uh, just just basic flight principles in in general. I studied this with the, uh, you know, as, as avidly as if I were planning to actually be a pilot. I don't I don't think that's going to happen, but you know, but I I so love the idea of aviation. So these simulators, the the neat thing about them is is that honest to God, you have to learn how to fly a plane. Uh, more or less as you would in the real world before you go up and you start blasting other players with bullets. And uh, so I, in combination with that, I started, I, I started reading once again, all kinds of first person uh, chronicles of war, from World War II. My favorite being uh, a book called the Jolly Rogers by uh, Tom Blackburn, who was a squadron leader. Uh, flew Corsairs in the, uh, in the Pacific in the, during the Solomon's campaign of 43 and 44. And somewhere along the line, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to actually write a book that takes these, the, this, my favorite uh, subjects, you know, at the time, the, the flying and horror. I, thought, I, wanna com I would like to combine the horror and the World War II premise. My, my first inspiration for that might have been uh, Paul Wilson's The Keep, although there's no, I, I would say no similarity whatsoever, but I thought uh, Paul did a great job of blending horror and war. Yeah. And I thought, although, and, you know, fortunately my subject matter was, was, was very, very different, but I kept in... Um, a, a consciousness of the way he detailed war as well as bringing in this Lovecraftian horror element. So uh, I, I actually did a, uh, a short story or it's more of a novelette called the children of Burma, which was sort of the precursor to blue devil Island. And it, it, it actually chronicles the flying tigers. And I had gotten in touch with one of the uh, original Flying Tigers um, by email who, who since passed on, um, just to get some of his reflections about the war. And of course, and I read a lot of, uh, of the nonfiction about uh, the Flying Tigers. And also, I, that, that premise, if you're familiar with Blue Devil Island, of the thing that exists, in, in the original story, The Children of Burma, that, that, that thing, that same force that exists in Blue Devil Island was actually originally in an area of Burma, and it was a Japanese um, engineering corp that went to build an airfield in Burma in 1942. And they encounter much the same um, oddities that happen in Blue Devil Island. And the story, I thought, came out very, uh, it, it, it did what it was meant to do, but I wanted to expand on it. And that is that was when I got the idea to actually write a novel. And in that case, I decided to go for uh, an American squadron um, in the Pacific and move it to an island, not make it on the mainland. And uh, like I said, that book came out in 2007. And it's it, that's another one that that's done uh, reasonably well between the various publishers, and it's probably my favorite. Uh, if 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 I were forced at gunpoint to pick a favorite of one of my books, I'd probably say that it was Blue Devil Island. I I think it took my favorite subject matter and put them together reasonably, well and reasonably successfully. And Blue Devil Island and the Gods of Moab, these are Lovecraftian themed. Stories. Oh, yeah, what, what other well, books? Wait, wait. Can I, can I ask? Uh, uh, you wrote a, a novella for Delirium Press, a flying tiger story. Oh yeah. Yeah. Was that the? Uh, was that incorporated into Blue Devil Island? Not so much, but it was a direct sequel to The Children of Burma. 
a direct sequel. It takes up at the moment uh, Children of Burma ended, but the point of view switches to the Flying Tiger pilot. Um, and, and actually, my original idea was not even uh, to, to tie it into the Children of Burma. My first idea that it was going to be a, a document of a night of horror spent by a pilot who's bailed out of his airplane and is hung in a tree and cannot escape. It was, and it was going to be more of a true life um, relation of what it must be like to realize you're stuck, you can't escape, you're 90 feet above the ground, hung in a parachute that may or may not give way at some time. And the more I got into that premise, the more I thought, you know, I could I could expand on that. I could actually what I could do is take one of the pilots that, uh, you know, in, in Children of Burma, the flying tigers briefly appear and shoot down a Japanese uh, flight of, of uh, fighters. So uh, in Epiphany is what that's called. Epiphany, a flying tiger story. The, it's the story of one of the pilots who's left the scene of the uh, events in Children of Burma, but they essentially follow him. Oh, yeah, that's in the first down. Dead by Dreaming, isn't it? Beg pardon? That's in the first Dead by Dreaming anthology, isn't it? I believe so. I'm pretty also, sure. Um, just so you know, if you want the Children of Burma, it's in the uh, collection Legends of the Night. Right. And I've had that one. I don't think it's currently the one, but I, I occasionally throw that one up on my website as a piece of free fiction. And it has been there, and uh, maybe I'll I'll put that one back up there again because it gets it does get a lot of hits. I, I wish it would. Uh, I don't. There hasn't been a lot of reviews of it. The few that I have seen have been very positive, but uh, it, it seems to be one that is amongst my body of work a little bit overlooked. So any visibility that story gets, I'm always happy for. Uh, to get back to Dark Shadows, Blue Devil Island as a, a member of the Collins family as a pilot. Uh, there again, there there is the insinuation <laughs> that there is a member of the Collins family from Dark Shadows. His name is Max Collins, but he is described to the T as possibly being Quentin Collins from the show. But once again, that's, that's one of those things that I, I, I don't like to take any risks as far as mixing properties that you know intellectual property from somebody else but i do like to do those little easter egg things you know that you know with a little stretch of the imagination i didn't I, realize I, I never realized that he might be quentin because <laughs> quentin is an immortal yes yes exactly and of course he survives blue devil this character does unlike most of the squadron oops what a giveaway i just looked it up uh Epiphany, a flying tiger story, is in Dead But Dreaming. Yeah. Which, by the way, for anyone listening to this, if you're a Lovecraft fan, you really need to own the original Dead But Dreaming. That's a fantastic it's anthology. A wonderful anthology, and that's not just because I have a story in it. That was that was a really strong uh, uh, collection of tales. Just just some really good modern Lovecraftian stuff in there. With the top review on it on Amazon by a certain. Matthew Carpenter. So. I can't imagine that. All lies. <laughs> well, you said it was good, so. Yeah, I, I have appreciated Matt's reviews over the years because Matt <coughs> always goes into depth, doesn't uh, uh, doesn't hold back. You, you're always um, very um, very honest and um, and detail oriented. You'll you'll pick out certain. Uh, um, aspects of stories, but but you're 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 so complete, and I, I look forward to a Matthew Carpenter review like like few others. Uh, well, they're not coming very often anymore. <laughs> yeah, it is true though. A lot of especially <laughs> what sound like an old man in the old days. You know, you're old, Mike. Pre Facebook and so forth. Uh, a lot of people looked to Matt's reviews back then to to uh, find out if an anthology or a book was good or not. Yeah. And I, I admire that because 
my my idea of a review is this book is good. You should read it. You know, it's about as in depth as I as I get. <laughs> it takes a certain talent to write a great review, especially without spoilers and and so forth. So yeah, well, I love a review that. I, you know, naturally, I love good reviews, but, you know, some, some of the best reviews of my work have been highly critical of it because I've never had uh, such an ego that I, that I look at a negative review. You know, I may call the, the reviewer an asshole once, but, but then my brain engages. And, and I, I do. I, I, can, I can learn things from reviews and uh, any kind of honest critique, a constructive critique, but I really do. I, I do use those. Uh, so I appreciate a reviewer like Matt, somebody who, uh, uh, it, it, like I said, is detail oriented and specific in, in the way he uh, described what's in it and how he felt about things. So I've got another question about your work, but just very quickly before I go there again, um, Dave, who's watching live right now, he wants to know, do you uh, well, I'll just read his question. Are there any flight simulators that you suggest for computers today? So if someone's into flight simulators, are you the still? The only one that I fly is uh, Aces High, and it's the third generation of the game, Aces High 3. And um, the website you go to for that is High Tech Creations. That's H-I-T-E-C-H creations.com. And okay. it's it's interactive. They They're... I don't know how many options for planes you've got, but you've got uh, bombers, you've got fighters, you've got, you can, you can, and it's not just the air stuff. You can command ships, you can get in tanks, different, different ground vehicles. And you have these campaigns where there's actually three teams at any given time. You've got the, the main arena has three teams all vying to, um, to win. Uh, each particular scenario, and, and that is by uh, capturing a set number of uh, of enemy airfields and territory. So, um, HighTechCreations.com, Aces yes, High yeah. 3. Yes, exactly. Okay. That's, um, that's the only one I, I fly. There. I know there's probably others, but that's the only one I can speak yeah. knowledgeably about. Well, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you, do I have this right? You self-published The Gods of Moab? That, yes, that's my my one foray into um, uh, that one. That was that's uh, the Kindle, uh, Amazon Kindle. Right. Uh, it it is a novella. Um, that again, it, it's based on actual experiences that that I had. Um, a New Year's Eve celebration a few years ago. I think it was 2011, going into 2012. Um, where some friends and I went up to a place called Chateau Morissette. It's a wonderful winery and restaurant up in the mountains of Virginia. And going up there, there was no problem. There had been a snowstorm, but the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway up to that point was clear. But down in the valley, there was a geocache. And by God, my friends and I, we wanted to get that geocache. And to get to it, we had to go off of the parkway and take this little mountain road. And once we got down this mountain road, holy cow, it wasn't clear anymore. It was nothing but ice, snow, sharp hairpin curves, sheer drop-offs. It was the most harrowing drive I have ever taken in my entire life. And I, part way down the mountain, I thought, you know, the only way this thing could be any scarier is if there was something after me. So I took that I, I took that premise and in in the novella there's something after. So talk about just just briefly talk about um, the positives and negatives as far as you're concerned with the other stuff that you've uh, that, uh, that you've had published a publisher has published mm -hmm. and between that and this um, self publishing the gods of Moab. Yeah. Um, I think I need more coffee. I can't articulate my questions today, yeah, but I think you know what I mean. I you, I think. <laughs> um, in uh, I, I've I've never been a fan of self-publishing, in that I I have tried to read 
an awful lot. Now, I know there, there are plenty of success stories, and, and certainly now, now the, the whole landscape of publishing has changed enough so that now you can find uh, you know, reputable writers doing self-publishing. But for the longest time, because the ease of self-publishing and it's, relative, uh, uh, it, it's relatively inexpensive, literally anyone could do it. And somebody with even minimal graphics knowledge, uh, you know, they might be able to write a good pitch. And there's all the self-published stuff out there. But and 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 I wanted to keep an open mind. I tried lots and lots of it there for a while. Uh, but it was like reading a freaking slush pile, right? And not a good one at that. Um, so I, I I think there has been over the years a a justified stigma. Uh, about self-publishing, and uh, and that is changing. Maybe for uh, m maybe with lots more positive changes yet to come. Um, I personally prefer to work with uh, an established editor, a good editor, um, rather than do it myself. Because, as, as I mentioned uh, almost facetiously earlier, I can type 120 words a minute, but I make 119 mistakes. <laughs> and I've, you know, I, I can get another reader to come along behind me and stuff, and that's that's fine. I, I know, I, and I have a graphics background, so I, you know, I can do, I can make a nice cover. I made the cover for Gods of Moab and all. At the end of the day, I'd still rather go the, uh, in most cases, I'd rather go the traditional publishing route, just simply because that's worked for the most right. part very well for me. Now, the Gods of Moab, certainly I get a bigger cut of sales, and, and I run a promotion now and again, and I get some nice spikes in sales. I, it's, it's certainly made as much money as I would have made going a traditional route, um, Although I, I think we talked about this the other day, novellas are uh, have been traditionally very, very hard to sell, but uh, it, it seems to be a format that uh, is a little more viable. It's more commercially viable now yeah. than uh, than it has been certainly in the time that I've been writing fiction. And so, um, yeah, there's definitely a trend towards them uh, lately. Yeah. I have another question. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. You know, great. Let's talk about Dark Shadows. Let's talk about these old stories. Now, you know, I understand that you're busy because I know, for pity's sake, life happens and you get swamped. Are you working on anything now? Why, yes, I am. Well, speaking, always, of, speaking of novellas, right, Mark? I'm always working on something. And these days, for many reasons, I tend to work more on short fiction than long fiction. I uh, Part of it is just physical limitation. Um, I, work, uh, I work for an educational publisher by day and do very intensive computer work at least eight hours a day, every single day. I try to write some every night, but by halfway through the evening, my eyes and my wrists are hurting. I mean, literally, my, my wrists are throbbing, I feel like, you know, like they got broken glass in them and my eyes truly give out on me. And that's, that's one of the reasons I can't even read as much as I want to because my, my aging eyes literally start blurring out on me. So I've, I've started focusing more on shorter fiction because the energy and time expenditure for a novel uh, it, 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 it's got to the point physically and, you know, being an old fart as I am, uh, it's tough. So the thing about doing shorter fiction, I can set myself a goal. I can usually meet a deadline with no problem. I can start something that I know I can finish in a reasonable amount of time. And the energy expenditure, uh, is more manageable, but I, I had an idea not very long ago that I thought this is going to require more than just a short story. I think uh, some of you may recollect that just a couple of months back there, uh, because of a prolonged drought in the Southeast, we had massive forest fires um, 
that took out countless acres of forest did damage over in the uh, Gatlinburg uh, area, Pigeon Forge. Lots of damage. Not Dollywood. Dollywood. <laughs> the same. Oh, my God. And some of the photographs I saw, and, and there's a place in uh, Carolina here called Lake Lure that had, uh, there was a, a rather um, large number of geocaches there that I had been after a couple of years back. But uh, so I saw these photos of Lake Lure, the countryside blazing, no, you know, all these places where all these caches were, all these places that I had been with, with a friend of mine uh, burnt up. All those caches are probably melted. Um, and it was rather personally painful for me to see areas that I knew and that uh, would like to go back to. Uh, just essentially burned up. And I got to thinking about uh, possibilities because of uh, there were there were certain um, photographs that I saw, you know, they were done by professional photographers and really quite stunning. And I thought, what about a character who is a professional photographer who goes to capture the uh, aftermath of this of a massive series of forest fires uh basically in that area and so i decided um, to work up a scenario that would involve not at, at first it wasn't necessarily lovecraftian but i wanted some kind of uh, uh frightening force and the more I thought about it, it's like, what if the fires brought something up? And this, and these characters uh, that, that go out to that area encounter it. And then I got to thinking, what if the if instead of that, what if the force, whatever that force, I'm not going to go into too much detail there, actually started those fires. And so I started playing with all kinds of ideas like that, and I, and I started firming up a plot, and I realized this is going to end up being a lot more than a short story. Not a novel's worth, but I thought, you know, I did The, the Gods of Moab as a novella, and I think it's about uh, 25,000, 30,000 words or so, and I can envision the piece that, I'm, that I started a little while back. I'm only about 15 pages into it right now. I tentatively call it conflagrations, but that, that's a working title. It may stick, it may not. But the more I explore the ideas that I've come up with, I was thinking, well, if I do it as a novella, maybe I'll, I'll do, once again, I may try doing the, the Kindle route. Uh, just because Gods of, Nova, uh, Gods of Moab did pretty well. It, Unlike a lot of, you know, unlike traditional publishing, where most often you'll get a payment up front and probably never see any more money after that from it. Uh, Gods of Moab paid royalties over time. Right. So I, I, like I said, I earned as much or more uh, from, from that. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's worth doing that again and uh so we'll we'll see we'll see where things go because uh like i said i'm sort of still in the early stages of getting this thing going but uh but i firmed up a plot and i'm working hard on it i'm uh it takes there it, it's in a at a it's in the winter the story is set in the winter and there is a lot of snow and ice that that complicate mobility and last uh, what was it, two weeks ago we had a a really nice snow, snowstorm here. So I went out walking and walked a mile or so up the, you know, through the neighborhood. And uh, it was a, it was a wonderful brainstorming session. When I came back in, I, I, I had a lot of stuff firmed up in my head for this story. <laughs> Kelly, you, you had, you want the last question? You had a question? Sure. Um, with the publishing industry changing so much and so many magazines going fully digital or even starting out as fully digital, has it ever crossed your, or has the thought ever crossed your mind of resurrecting Death Realm or is that door firmly closed? As 
a magazine that would come out on a regular basis, I don't see how I could manage that uh, given my, my schedule and, uh, and my desire to devote as much energy to my own writing as I can. However, I have approached um, a publisher with the idea of resurrecting De uh, Death Realm as at least an anthology, possibly a series of anthology. And I've, I've approached a few writers about committing to it. The only thing is right now, there's a lot going on uh, with the publisher and things have been really slow. They're definitely interested. Uh, it looks like there's a good chance that it's going to happen, but things are, are, progress is slower than, than I think would be optimum. But I feel like this is, you know, this year is the 30th anniversary of, of, uh, uh, of Death Realm's genesis and the 20th anniversary of its demise or retirement. And it seems like a good time to do something with that property. I mean, Death Realm defined uh, who I was for a lot of years. I mean, I, I, I uh, happily went by the epithet Mr. Death Realm. You know, I'd go to World Fantasy Convention. Oh, there's Mr. Death Realm, you know. Great stuff. I, I really enjoyed that. And while I don't want to, uh, I would never want to go back to the, the commitment when I, God almighty. And Mike, you probably, you probably understand this as much as anybody. Yeah. God and you, Kelly. Uh, too. You commit yourself to a, a regular ongoing product like that. And it, it becomes your whole freaking life. I mean, I spent, I, I had a full-time job, but death row, and certainly that last few years in particular occupied a second full-time job. And, and it doesn't pay. Started. And it doesn't pay like a full-time job. Pay like a full -time <laughs> job. I'm, and at some, you know, there, there came a time that I thought I am one crazy, stupid, passionate motherfucker. You know, I'm doing this <laughs> thing that doesn't pay me deadly uh, other than yeah. in goodwill. And, and I, that, that and, and I will be completely honest, I think it was the goodwill that Death Realm earned over a long run that kept me doing it because there, there was clearly an appreciation for Death Realm in the field. And I would love to yeah. put something else out there with the Death Realm moniker on it, the brand, to show that, you know, what, what, we had me the, the writers and i that we put together back then i've never wanted to completely divest myself of that property and like i said right now it's the 30th freaking anniversary and that that makes me feel like how did i get this damn old that's 30 <laughs> freaking years ago and yet i remember what it was like day after day after day doing the production work reading all this stuff playing collection agent and that 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 was the problem with death room right there was that our chief distributor was fine print at the time and they went bankrupt owing death room to the tune of like twelve thousand dollars and that was not not something you just sucked up no and um well if it if it does not work out with the publisher you're looking at uh keep lovecraft easy and press in mind because i do think that's a that would be a really neat th thing to do especially this year yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I will. I'll definitely. I'll definitely do that because I, I. I just feel like the time is right, given that that so many of the writers that got their either got their start in Death Realm or contributed heavily to Death Realm, they're still going. A lot of them, and I, I've had several writers, you know, who have become real successes, have, have personally told me, you know, Death Realm played a great part in my development as a writer and that as a, as an editor, um, that, that may be one of the most gratifying things any, any, anyone could say that, you know, that I played a part in someone's success in their, in their dream to do what they're doing. Yeah. And, and it's a mutual thing too, because if it weren't for them, you know, death room wouldn't have, wouldn't have become what it did. And all these years later, I feel like, you know, at least for a short time, I'd like to put on the Mr. Death Realm hat again. Sure. 
I it, think we'd all like to see it's that. This, it's this. It's this. Actually, this is actually my geocaching hat. But yeah. <laughs> Well, you do that. We'll have to. Uh, we'll have to make a death realm cab for you. So I have a death realm T-shirt. Still got it. <laughs> well, Mark, thank you so much for being on the show. It's always really great to talk with you. Uh, yeah, so. it is a true pleasure, and I thank you for having me back. I, I really do, and uh, I enjoy the opportunity. And it's always great to see all of you guys. You too, Kelly. It was well, great to meet you for the first time. Very nice to meet you, Mark. Thanks. All right. Take care, Mark. Take Thanks. Care. Thanks a lot. Great man. seeing you, bro. Thank you. Um, I was going to say, was Mark, um, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. We're going to probably talk for another 20, 30 minutes here, depending on when we run out of steam. You can either leave or you're welcome to stay for our gabbing. That's what we usually do after the guest. I'll, I'll, so. I'll, I'll hang out for a few here unless I need to get up and go pee or something. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got a nice email to read, first of all, to the audience. Uh, this is from Jonathan. I'm not sure if I'm going to say his last name correctly, Dornellis. And I don't read every email I get here, but I just this really made my day. I was having a bad day the other day, and this really made my day. Uh, hi, Mr. Davis. I discovered the Lovecraft Easing Talk Show you host on YouTube close to two years ago. Uh, I've never listened live, but listening on YouTube has become a pleasant part of my nightly routine three times per week usually. I have struggled with insomnia for most of my life, and listening to your show has had a peculiar effect on me. My daily worries and anxiety melt away, and your subdued tone of voice, he's not talking about Kelly here, I'm sure, uh, yeah. never fails to lull me to sleep. Although he could be oh, arguing, yeah. Kelly argued, I think, that I, I put him to sleep. I trust that's not like a backhanded compliment. No, I hope not. I don't think it is. But yes, um, I fall asleep listening to the Lovecraft audiobooks on YouTube. Thanks to you, I discovered the Night Ocean, other Lovecraft-related gem gems that I had not been aware of. Uh, he also asked, I know you edit stories and asked about any of my original fiction. The answer to that question is, I do have a short story out in the anthology Cthulhu Lies Dreaming, and uh, which is a very nice anthology, and put out my Ghostwoods books. And I've got a novella coming out, speaking, we were just talking about novellas, um, and that will be out this year. I especially want to have copies to bring to, to uh, Necronomicon. It's called The Furthest City Light, and it's uh, kind of a noir cosmic horror type thing so so that'll be out this year uh i've read a couple chapters and it's really good what i've read so far i oh, can't wait you. to buy that and not read it i know <laughs> I, I as, need, as, as long as you buy it that's the important. <laughs> I mean, just like the last 40 books i've bought from everybody that i haven't had a chance to read yet <laughs> well that's you know what that's because you support the people you know so it's, it's a nice thing to do <laughs> That's sort of because what Mark was alluding to earlier, when he, he used to be he used to be this crazy reader who could read everything, and then when you get older, yeah, it doesn't work that way anymore. Now we're more discriminating, or we just don't have as much time, or we're just <laughs> our eyes fail us, as Mark was saying. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, I, I, there's a quote from Robert Price. He had said something like he thought he could start over reading again at the beginning of his collection. Yeah, that's him. Reading everything he had already read because he didn't remember it anymore and still have plenty of reading, you know, to till his dying day without ever picking up anything new. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way. I yeah, still have I that. copies that people sent me back in death realm days. I mean, probably a closet full of books that I don't know if I will ever get to. Yeah, I yeah, he said Mr. Davis. So, yeah, you're right, Matt. Um, all right, so Necronomicon tickets are on sale for those of you in the audience who don't know. Uh, Necronomicon is, uh, oh boy, when is it? It's in August, I know that. Is it the 20th? The 7th. Yeah, it's around Love Crest birthday, yeah. Um, the gold and silver passes are already sold out, but the regular passes there's still plenty of those left i believe you don't so, need a gold, gold pass to enjoy the heck out of that oh hell no uh so august 17th through 20th i just found it i will try to link to that later so if you're actually if you're listening to this later on on the audio podcast 
I'll have a link to it. But if you, it's basically necronomicon providence.com and then just click on passes or tickets or whatever. So there's that. Um, and then there is a very nice, I will link to this as well. But Arkham Bazaar, our friends Brian and Gwen Callahan, they have a really cool um, box set, uh, four DVD box set of the best of movies, short films from the Lovecraft uh, Film Festival for the past few years. So for those who are watching, here's mine. They sent me one. It is really envious, really <laughs> awesome. Um, and I'll just take some of these out so you guys can see them. And I'll read them for the people who are listening. There's uh, Classics Volume 1 and Volume 2. And then there's Best of 2015 and Best of 2014. And I've not been able to get into these yet because I just got them the other day. But I noticed that there's a Night Ocean movie in there. So I'm really looking forward to that. So if you've never been able to make it to the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, or even if you have, this is a really great way to see some of them, especially if, if, you, if you've not been able to go. So that's, uh, it's pricey, but it's worth it. So, and then if you're a filmmaker, I'll also try to link to this, the deadlines for this year in October, if you, uh, to submit short films and their requirements. So, all right, you guys got anything? I've got a couple more things, but I don't want to. Well, are we going to talk monopolize. about awards or anything, or is that going to be under the wraps? Are we going to talk about what? Awards. We can talk about awards. Um, I. Uh, what do you want to say? Oh, I just comp You know, it's always interesting to see whether Lovecraftiana ever wins any awards. I made a, a note and published it to the Easy Web page of uh, what I know of in terms of. Uh, Award-winning Lovecraftian fiction. Although I gotta say, I've not looked at the British awards. So. Oh, I see, I see your note here on the message board. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'm just kind of uh, wondering. Um, you know, I just don't know how. Like some of these stories make it, and some don't. Uh. Could be politics. <laughs> I don't know. Could be. Uh, could be that Lovecraftian fiction doesn't win awards. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think if you appear in a book with me, you will never win an award. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna write that. I, mean, I need to write that down. So. I would okay. say, Mike, it's probably a little from column A and a little from column B. I think there's some, definitely some politics that, that are involved in this. And you see a lot of people lobbying when, uh, when their books are coming out. Now, awards are still pretty important to a lot of people, uh, if only just to get more eyes on your work. So I'm not very good at being political or, you know, or lobbying. I, so. I think we're such a small niche. You know, it's like if Ellen Datlow edits an anthology of Lovecraft that gets a lot more attention than if, you know, Mike Davis does. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's interesting. Charlie Strauss has won several Hugo Awards for his Lovecraftian type work in the laundry files. It's not to say that I don't like it, but, you know, that doesn't mean it's like the best thing out there to represent Lovecraftian fiction. It's just, he's yeah. more currency because he's well known already. Well, we were talking about this a little bit before the show. There's a little bit of difference or there is a difference. I feel, correct me if you guys feel I'm wrong between something like we mentioned this, this is horror awards at the beginning and some of these other awards where I view something like this is horror as kind of a people's choice award where the, the fans can vote. So that doesn't seem to be, there's not as much lobbying, you know, it's not who knows who. Um, do you guys agree with that? Disagree? 
Yeah, I think so. And I think that's a lot like um, at film festivals. It's it's nice to win um, best short film or best adaptation or whatever you're in there for. But what is really nice to win is the audience award because that's that's the award you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, Matt. Uh, you know, I don't think that, well, Adam Cthulhu is not on the Stoker list. Um and I seriously doubt it's going to win a Shirley Jackson. I don't think a book with the title Autumn Cthulhu is going to win a Shirley Jackson award, no matter how good it is. Right, which is a shame, but, you know, uh, beyond the ego stroke, it's like, it's not even clear to me that awards help sales. I don't think they do. Maybe a slight spike. Um, but as you know, I've made a study for a couple of decades of marketing and promotion. So I do kind of know what I'm talking about and I agree with you. I don't think they help sales. Well, maybe Joe can comment because, um, he's actually edited award-winning anthologies and I don't know if they're, if he thinks it helps sales at all. Um, sales actually... Um, were much better, not, not that they were bad on other things, but much better on, um, well, the season in Carcosa sold mountains, I, I mean, mountains, and then A Groom's Drives Puppets, which was the Legati tribute anthology, that, that sold very, very well, but and won the Shirley Jackson Award. Uh, was not was a finalist for the Bram Stoker Award same year. Um, but season in Carcosa just blew the doors off sales wise. Um, that benefited from the True Detective push though, didn't it? Uh, no, it actually because season in Carcosa was before True Detective. Oh, okay. it, it got a it got a second push, um, but. Uh, even way before True Detective, season in Carcosa sold. There was oh. people people wanted to read King and Yellow stuff. Um, you know, I get still get a ton of Facebook messages um, asking because I had at one point said I would love to do another season in Carcosa, and you know, people are is is that in the works? Is that in the works? Is that in the works? And no, it's not in the works because. You know, if I could find a publisher, well, yeah, it will be in the works. Plus, I, I did a um, uh, Casilda song, so. Um, but the, the King in Yellow stuff did so far much better than than the other things. Casilda um, song was nominated for um, World, World Fantasy Award, right? Yeah, but, and and these awards are nice. Um, uh, I, I don't agree on the Shirley Jackson Award. I think the Shirley Jackson Award is the pinnacle. Um, and I'm not saying that because I won it. Um, but I don't think that, first off, it's a jury system, which is good. Yeah, it's a different system. And the system other thing is, is I, I really have the sense when you look at year in, year out at the nominees for the Shirley Jackson Award. Um, they are only concerned about the work. They don't look down their noses at anything. Um, you know, uh, but I mean, okay, and, and because we're talking anthologies, we'll stick with anthologies for a moment. Um, you know, there's only, they don't have 10 finalists they don't have 20 finalists um so every year and again this is part of taste but there there are going to be things that i think are deserving and i'm sure many people involved with the shirley jackson awards think are deserving that don't make the list um if, if we sit here and we go okay name your five favorite horror movies you're going to name five, 
and yet there's two more that are eating you alive you didn't get to add because you were right. stuck with a limitation of five and I think think that's um, uh, absolutely part of the Shirley Jackson Awards um, uh, I, I think the World Fantasy Awards function mo much the same way um, uh, the the HWA you know the, their lists are much much longer to start with or at least their preliminary recommendations um, uh, do I I've seen their final lists not agreed sometimes. Uh, you know, awards are, they're a lot of fun. I'm excited to get them. Absolutely stunned. You know, I mean, with Grim Scribes Puppets, you know, everybody said, oh, that's got a really good chance. It's got a really good chance. And I'm like, yeah, uh -huh, sure, right, sure. Uh, pass the pipe. Um, well, that's what I thought. I didn't think, you know, I mean, I look at the list and it's like, you know, the other thing too is we see Ellen on these lists all the time, mm -hmm. rightfully so. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ellen's the best. I, th I think the only negative anybody should be able to say about any Ellen anthology is... <clears throat> Maybe they didn't like story A because it wasn't to their particular taste. But there's no filler in a book by Ellen. Um, you are getting really great writers who bring their A game. You, you may not like a particular story because of its theme, you know, but the, these are great books. Ellen does a book. It's a great book, period. Or in my case, you know, 75 exclamation marks. Um, <laughs> well, hey, uh, it's just the way I see it. Um, uh, but Yeah, I wasn't going you know, to. In the last couple of years, there's quite a few. I mean, if, if you're looking at these lists and normally – there's five, and again, we'll stick with anthologies. There's five finalists for the anthology. And you look down, and it's like, where is that? How can that not be there? But you look at the other five, and like, wow, those are... So, it's... So the, the system for the say the Stokers as opposed to the Shirley Jackson the the selection system is what you what you're saying is it's different. Yeah, it's different. Um, it, it, you you prefer the Shirley Jackson system, which I see exactly what you're saying. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I I like a juried system, and it's only a jur you know it's only jurors. Um, I got a question about that. Let because. Um, I wasn't going to submit Autumn Cthulhu to the um, the Stokers or or any awards. And then my wife pointed out because I'm just I don't know, I'm just not big on awards as you guys know. My wife said, you know, it's an anthology. It's not about you. It's about the authors that are in that anthology. And I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. right. So submitted to the Stokers. I'm submitting to the Shirley Jackson. My question on the Shirley Jackson is: There's five jurors, I believe. Two of those jurors have stories in Autumn Cthulhu. How does that affect it, guys? Well, apparently it doesn't affect the uh, the Stokers at all. <laughs> Since <laughs> half of the people that win are, are vice presidents or part of the board. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, with, with the hey, Shirley Jackson hey, board, hey, I, don't, hey. I don't know if if, if those people would recuse themselves, but you have you have different jurors for different categories with Shirley Jackson, so maybe in the anthology category, writers aren't jurors there. Um, Mark, were you going to say something? I was just I was just saying it. That there's a lot of uh, a lot of the awards thing is about appearances. And if, if I were running 
an award and some of the writers involved were up for award, or you know the jurors i should say if the jurors or the the judges are up for award i would not allow them to but i would get i would get all together i i would want some semblance of par, of impartiality there and i think that uh, the the gist of what i'm hearing is that there, there's a, a distinct lack of uh, impartiality in the selections process so if you're a co-vice president you don't think you should win hell no <laughs> no 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 hey you know i agree if, with you yeah you know i i mean if if if, if you've been the co-chair of the convention two or three or however many times, geez, and then you edit a book, you know, there's got to be some kind of inclination by the members of that society to, like, be nice to you. No. Hey, you know, back in the 90s, when, when Death Room was still, was going under uh, Stan Tal's, um, pub, he was the publisher, and he decided that the Death Room Awards would be a great idea for uh, promoting the field, for promoting the magazine, etc. But for me, the, uh, I mean, it, it actually worked out. We had a really nice award designed and we had a couple of them there was, i think the death room awards ran for two years and they were in conjunction with uh, uh, i don't remember if it was a world horror maybe but a couple of years we did death room awards the only thing is is and and this was hard to reconcile in that no work from death room could be considered we and, and that right. not isn't right. necessarily fair to the writers because you know some of those writers may have done award worthy work but we were very very concerned about a sense of propriety and certainly nothing that i um, uh, that i produced personally uh, could be in consideration what we ended up doing was getting a number of uh, jurors basically who were completely unaffiliated with death realm to uh, judge the works in question. And um, it was, it was an interesting process. I, I, and I remember I presented the uh, death realm award at, uh, or what, however many of them we had. Um, I believe it was at world horror and uh, Kathy Koja won the, the world horror award or the, the death realm award at world horror. And uh, I, I remember presenting that to her, and it was very well done. But I felt I felt damn weird presenting an award because I was a magazine publisher and I was a writer. I I swear I think awards processes should exist independently, and and maybe it's Absolutely. not even practical. It's not practical, maybe, but somehow keeping the process independent of the creative process of those who are producing. <coughs> Uh, the work uh, that's how that's how you would legitimately uh present uh, present awards yeah, I, yeah. I agree with that completely and nobody is um questioning the quality of the work that has won even if they you know if it was right. palisano winning you know his his writing is unquestionably good but it does it does cast a bit of shade on the whole process you know and it, it can be very counterproductive um, because let me give you an example. My wife's a teacher and she's, I know I'm biased, but she's a damn good teacher. And she's been a teacher four or five years now. And she would see month after month, other teachers winning teacher of the month. I mean, teachers that didn't care teachers that literally would go out to their car on break and, you know, well, I better not say anymore. I'm, I'm being broadcast, but they weren't good teachers, but they would win because of political reasons. Okay. And they would win because of this. They would win because of that and not because of the quality of the work. By the time they finally got around to Danielle winning an award, she just felt like, well, it was just my turn. You know, it's kind of a consolation prize. Exactly. So in that way, they're counterproductive. Hmm. 
you know, now certainly not the way the Shirley Jacksons are done. I mean, that seems to be very above board. Yeah. Well, in my opinion. So yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, if if, if award season comes around and, and the processes are what the processes are, um, you know, are are some better than others? Depending on where you're sitting, perhaps yes. Um, uh, they come out, we look at them, we pay whatever attention, you know. Um, well, certainly, if, if somebody hands me an award, if you win, congratulations. Yeah. You know, um, if somebody hands me an award, I'm not going to throw it back at them. I think it's a it's if I win an award, it's for anything ever. It's it's great, and I'll say thank you, and I'll appreciate it sincerely. But oh, yeah, I'm not going to lobby for it. You know what I mean? I'm not going to. Mike, I give Lovecraft anything the Death Room Award on the spot, just <laughs> just because, just because. Well, I think Kelly, you're going to do the Strange Eons Awards soon, aren't you? Yeah, we were we were actually calling it the Charles Dexter Awards. <laughs> um, oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, that's but, oh, I love that. But love we'll that. be we'll be doing that, and that's really going to be. Um, that's going to not be best novel of the year. That's going to be our favorite novel of the year. That's going to be our favorite podcast, that kind of stuff, because we're not really going to be putting it up to vote. We're just going to be giving awards to the people that we really appreciate. And those that have given you money, right? Right. That's what I mean by really appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right. Lord. So anyway, that was the awards topic. So. Uh, what else do we have to talk about? Um, I'm reading a book called The Shadow of the Wind, and it's not Lovecraft in any way. That's not why I bring it up. But a lot of people ask me what I'm reading at sometimes, and I picked this up on Amazon for a dollar ninety nine the other day. Zaphon uh, is a genius. I love all his books. Yeah. Well, this is the first one of his that I've read. And I love books about books, you know what I mean? So, since we're all, we all appreciate books. It's called The Shadow of the Wind, The Cemetery of Forgotten, book one. Yeah. So, okay, and, so my... And you my, need the yeah. other two. You're, you you're like, going to... Yeah, Matt, what? If you like books about books or stories about stories, I have a graphic novel for you. Okay. It's called The Unwritten. Okay. Uh, about a kid who, a young man who was like in his uh, father's stories, like uh, his name was in the stories, like uh, like the Harry Potter stuff. And then things just go crazy from there. Okay. A really, really well done graphic novel. I'll check it out. All right. What else do we have to talk about? Did we cover everything? I guess we did. <laughs> so anyway, uh, HP Lovecraft Film Festival, four, four, four DVD box set. I really can't recommend this highly enough because there's a lot of good short films in, in each one of these. Especially that Classics Volume 2. Why are you in there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but also, it's <laughs> my favorite of back. the... It's my favorite of the volumes, too, because it's also got, uh, uh, I believe, Eel Girl is on there, and then... Um, Eel Girl, yeah. Oh, I can't remember the musical one they did, but I loved it. Uh, oh, which one's yours? We did The Shunned House. Oh, The, the Shunned House, right. Right, right, right. Okay. Anyway, I have one of these, and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> A big dick. <laughs> um, All right. So, so next week we don't have a guest. We do have a show, but we don't have a guest. And then the week after that, on February the fifth, uh, Stephen Graham Jones will be our guest. Whoa. So, and then the week after that, on the twelfth, it'll be Ellen Datlow. So, cool. Got some great guests coming up. Yeah. Uh, 
thanks for being on the show, guys. Mark, really great to talk with you again. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me back. It, this is always sure. a pleasure. And it's a pleasure just to always hang out with, with a lot of you there. I appreciate it. Great All right. Well, we'll see bro. everybody next week. Thanks, thanks a lot, guys. Mike.